you, everyone. That was our new theme song from our friend Nick Cohen, uh, putting his music composition degree to good use. Finally, once in as his we've life. all been anticipating, and here at Two Nosy Meerkats, I'm Gabby Jordan Brown, and I am Lucas Arnold. Welcome to episode five of Two Nosy Meerkats podcast. Thank you for hanging in with us, and we have a spectacular guest today. Uh, you have seen him, uh, we hope, at Stand Up New York performing. You may have also seen him in your dreams because he is the skin of the gods. I am jealous. Uh, you have name... seen him modeling skincare at Nature Republic and Lush and you, you have anywhere seen him... where skin is had. <laughs> <laughs> you have seen him giving birth to the concept of skincare. You saw him. You've seen him giving birth. <laughs> Please keep Alex it going Kim, for everyone. Alex Kim, everyone. Ooh. Oh my God! Thank you so much for that skin deep introduction. Oh, I, I love it. That. Yeah. <laughs> no, like when I, I, I was doing when I do comedy, sometimes people people come up to me afterwards. They say, "I think they're gonna con- like say how funny I am." They're like, "Oh my God, you have such great skin." I'm like, "Am I funny though?" Yeah, like, that, that was the whole point <laughs> of what I did up there. That's cool. <laughs> but yeah, I'm happy to be here. Uh, I'm so happy to be at uh, Two Noisy Earth Cats. Well, we only do we're comedy so for glad. the skincare, and we're glad you're yeah. here. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we we have, we yeah we're, you're here for mainly skincare, and then like I heard you do comedy on the side. I only just heard Ooh. that before we started recording. So, okay. Yeah, it's the largest uh, organ. You got to take care of it. You know, got to keep it moist. It is the largest organ. That is a true little science fact for anyone uh, interested in biology. Yeah. Did you know that it was the largest organ in the body? I was only just reminded. I I don't, but you know by. I'm not a scientist, but by derivative property, I'm sure I can, like, imagine that there's not a bigger organ than the one that covers your entire body. Like, I don't think you have to be a genius to know that skin is probably the... I'm never going to be like, oh, probably it's your liver. Like, your liver is probably bigger than your skin, you know? That is actually... Alex, you actually touched on something that I relate to a little bit, because, like, at open mics or just in comedy... If I'm complimented on something, people will sometimes say, like, you have a nice voice instead of yeah. saying, like, you were really funny or you had really good jokes or something like that. And so yeah, I was... definitely relate to that. Yeah, one time someone told me that my face is very symmetrical. I'm like, I did jokes, too. <laughs> <laughs> like, you guys, really these are a first world problem because I've never been complimented on anything but my comedy. And you know what? It pisses I'm trying me to point off. out life's asymmetricality. What are you doing? <laughs> I don't want someone to notice my fucking jokes. I want them to be like, you are hot up there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we were all hard the entire time. That's what I want. I want someone screaming, like, take your shirt off. No one ever does that for me. And they're like, all right, Gabby, that joke was okay. <laughs> we all I don't want you to laugh. <laughs> I don't want you to laugh. I want you to need new underwear, okay? They're dry. I don't like that. <laughs> The goal is to make audiences wet. And speaking of wet, this actually is not a segue at all. But um, you guys should know, (laughs) Lucas knows this, Alex, I don't know if you know this, by by nothing that we did on purpose, Two Nosy Meerkats just happens to be the 126th most popular comedy podcast in Israel. 124th, actually. What? We went... (laughs) Yeah, we went past uh, Netanyahu's oh <laughs> podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Zionism rules. We went past that one. Are they gonna send Maybe you like, the a YouTube podcast? Button, you know. Yes. Oh, <laughs> if only they knew about my birthright trip. I don't know if I'd be so popular there. Did anymore. you go on birthright? How was that? Well, I I was offered a threesome by two Buharian Jews from Queens who ended up later marrying each other. So if you count that as a great trip, I don't know that I do. Wow. It was, it was very weird. It was like that my best friend and my sister came on the trip with me and my best friend said something I'll never forget, which is like, if you told half of these people the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is over, they'd be like, all right. Like they just didn't, they were just really like, rock dumb stupid i hate calling anyone stupid but they were the stupidest people i ever met the guides like tried to actually give us like both sides of the israel palestinian conflict they just didn't want to hear it and 
So this one girl, I have that bit about how she broke up with her boyfriend over FaceTime yeah, at the yeah. Holocaust Museum. Mm -hmm. But that's not like all that happened. Like that was preceded by like a beginning and end of events where like her boyfriend was this 26 year old man and she was 18 who lived back home and her parents didn't approve of him in part, not because of the age gap, but because he wasn't Jewish. And so she had this friend who came on the trip with her, presumably to like help her and like watch her. But her friend got sick halfway through the trip and had to leave conveniently she had an aunt that lived like an hour away from whatever stop in israel we were at and then so this girl rebecca who ended up breaking up with the boyfriend was all alone and she met a guy named gabe who imagine a brick imagine just a brick and then imagine he's a person that's gabe <laughs> i was once on the bus with gabe and he showed me a picture of a girl on instagram and was like she's hot right and i was like okay yeah and she was like he he's he said to me oh well, it's too bad I'm related to her. That's Gabe. That's Gabe. Gabe and Rebecca ended up shacking up, and that's who offered me a threesome later in the trip. And I politely declined Whoa. because I did not want it. they're married now. They are married. They have two children. Oh, my God. Oh, you should have been there that we sung to be at their wedding. <laughs> like, I was going to say... Story. I was going to say, like, be the godmother of their children. <laughs> the fact that they didn't ask me, honestly, I'm offended. <laughs> I'm upset. <laughs> I just that's a logical next step. Yes, absolutely. I just imagine like looking at these kids and thinking, you were nearly mine. Just like <laughs> just like what a mind fuck that would be. I wanna visit them someday and be like, you have no idea how you came to be, but I unfortunately yeah. do. <laughs> I could have witnessed. <laughs> Um, Alex Kib oh, yeah. sorry, go on, Lucas. Oh no, I was I was gonna say a quick thing, which is that there was someone what I went to middle school with, who I was aware was into me and I wasn't into her. And then in high school, we also went to the same high school. She got pregnant and I saw her like pushing her child in a stroller. And it was just a weird, it's a weird thing to think of like a peer that I wouldn't, that I wasn't interested, but like if, if I was, we, do you understand what I mean? Just like a weird thing of like someone who was in, it has a kid now, just like a peer. It was just. And it could have been your yeah. kid. Exactly. That's yeah, basically feel, it, yeah. It feels the same way when I see my high school friends, they're getting married now. It's just like, like you, like, like at my age, they're, you know, they're getting married already. And it's like, you're the kid who like, you know, I helped cheat, you know, I give you my paper, you know, and now you have, now you're married. It's just, it's just weird. That's so weird. Alex, did you almost impregnate anyone? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, uh, did you just help people cheat? Yeah, he I just had like, he just has like a, a harem, a forgotten harem, <laughs> just like out in the out in the world. No, yeah, not even no, not even close. Uh, you know, I thought I was uh, straight, very young. You know, I mm -hmm. thought that I like girls, but uh, uh, in my middle school, I was like, why do I? You know, it was still confusing, but I was still like, oh, this is why I like guys now. You know? Yeah. Was it a thing of like, so for me, I feel like it was like I had a crush on a girl, but I didn't like really recognize it for what it is because I didn't see myself as like, I was fine with other gay people, but I didn't necessarily see myself as gay. So I would like have a crush and be like, I'll deal with that later. It probably doesn't mean anything. Were you the same way or was it like when you had a crush, you were like, I know this is a crush? Uh, I always knew that there was like an attraction. And like, well, so I think so a lot of gay people, uh, they had the similar feeling as like they, when they see like a male's body, they think that they want that body. They think that, oh, that's just me. They want that big chest or abs or whatever. Mm. So I, th I thought that was my, my problem for a while. I'm using air quotes. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, but then I was like watching gay porn. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I guess, I <laughs> guess that. You were watching gay porn. Like, I want those bodies. <laughs> like, <laughs> bodies like yeah. inside I want and them outside. To I want them to go together exactly like this. If they could just do that, like, and <laughs> yeah, do this exact choreography. That would be great. Yeah. <laughs> this um, is so fat. This is, I just, I just love hearing about this. Cause I, I just find it so fascinating. Cause it's just, it's just something I've never experienced. I just, and I, and I've heard similar things. And I, I find this so fascinating. Just the discovery of like, cause like, I know that, that I think it was in like a science class of describing like people, going like insane almost of like not figuring out how they how they react to stuff no that it's um 
that they have a reaction to something and then they try to find the source for it. It's not like you have like this clear idea of how stuff affects you. It's that you get affected and then you try to look around your environment and try to figure out what has stimulated you that way. And that it's that sort of, it's a very conscious thing you have to figure out. And so I just, I'm, I'm just so fascinated to hear about like this like self-discovery. Yeah, you know, I thought I was gonna marry a girl up until when I was a freshman in college. Because because I've never been with anyone right uh, mm -hmm. at that time, and so I thought like you know until it happens I don't know for sure right but I've never had sex with a woman I've only had gay sex. Um, yeah I think I don't know if you agree with this but for me when I realized that I was into girls it was something that kind of hit me like a ton of bricks because I wasn't expecting it. And in that way, I feel like it made it hotter. And I was always like, I, I, I almost feel bad for straight people that they don't have this because there's this expectation. If you're a prince, you're going to find your princess. If you're mm -hmm. a princess, your prince will come to you or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I would like, when I thought I was more straight, you know, I would like do that like on the playground. I would like point out guys and be like, I like that guy and just kind of like fixate it until I liked him. And then when it hit me suddenly that I was attracted to girls, it was like, I would look at a girl and be like, wow, what am I feeling? And that to me was, for some reason, closeted sex is just the hottest. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like you're, it feels like you're a, like a secret agent because, you know, you have this, you'll see uh, this stuff that you can't express to anyone and, that, and people think they know you like your first identity. So, yeah, it's like, super exciting when, uh, like, when I told, when I came out to my first friends, like, yeah, it's, it was gay sex, you know. But like, well, it was funny because they knew before oh. I did. <laughs> Tell us about that. Wait, how old were you? I was 19. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it was because like, I remember the first time, uh, the first friend I made in um, college was my, was my roommate, right? And the dorm was all girls. It was all girls and uh, he's like, he gave me a fist bump, right? So no, he, and I was like, I was like, yeah. And he said, from, he said from that moment, he saw, he, he felt something was off because <laughs> he felt like I was, he could sense like I was acting, but he didn't know. And yeah. then, uh, probably when you slammed his fist so hard it broke, <laughs> he, were, he was like, that guy is compensating for something. <laughs> so but he looked at like the stump of his hand, like that was a bit much. He might, <laughs> there might be it's something going like, on. Overzealous. <laughs> No, oh yeah. So then, um, there's so like you know, they, you know, they're they're nice. They didn't like, like hey, you're gay, right? It was it, the way my friends found out was that I uh, had my phone, my phone out on the table reading reading dinner, and then I got a text from someone, and I, I but I named him in the context like someone, and then in quotation marks from Grinder, just so I, I knew. So the text came up, and that name like, showed up brightly on the phone, and then the friend who was next to me, she thought. She confused Tinder for Grinder for a second, and then she was like, "Oh my God! Oh, you have Grinder too!" And then I, I was just like so shocked. And then all my friends who knew I was gay, but we never talked about it, they were like, "What are you talking about?" Because I, I was I was frozen. I didn't know what to say. And Aww. then we had yeah, then we had a talk. But they were nice. And then then that's what my roommate told me. Like, yeah, I knew because you were like, "Yeah, girls." Am I right? <laughs> oh my god that is so cute that's like everyone who who knew it about me before i did i would be like i'm into girls they're like yeah you wrote your college essay about playing baseball like obviously there was something very queer about you growing up but you really don't know what's going on in people's heads until you know you actually tell them because you just it's the queer thing you like kind of yeah. think it's your secret and it's like yeah. your thing to have as a secret you know, until yeah, you, yeah. until you, you want really to. Think, yeah. And it feels so alone because mm. like the whole, because I grew up in the church, right? So I thought I was straight most of my life. Right. And, and like all these feelings towards guys was always like, oh, this is like a phase or something, you know? Uh, I remember I was in, uh, I was at a church retreat and the, one of the guys, were, one of the pastors were talking and they're talking, they were just talking about gay people. And they're like, this doesn't happen in the animal kingdom. There are no gay giraffes. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I 
Wait, why are we talking about gay? Yeah. Forgive me for pausing. Gayest animal. I'm calling it. <laughs> no, yeah, with those long necks. <laughs> and the patterns, come on. Yeah. Those are always in fashion, right? Yeah. There, and also, that pastor was wrong, because clearly he didn't read yeah, that New course. York Times article years ago about Sven and Magic, the gay penguins. Yeah. Yes, of course. <laughs> I love Sven and Magic. They describe their personalities so, like, Sven is, like, kind of the, the like, butch, <laughs> like, strong, stoic one, and Magic's kind of, like, the twink, and he, like, walks around, like, requesting attention from Sven. Like, you would really compare that to a lot of relationships. Wait, uh, it, Alex, between Sven you and your boyfriend, like I got these for you. <laughs> who's the Sven and who's the Magic? Who's the Mar and who's Luigi? Ah, uh, yes, the uh, two genders. <laughs> Do you identify as a spend or a magic? <laughs> that should be the new question. That sounds much more fabulous. Um, doing a hard pivot for a second, I wanted to ask you, Alex. I wrote down a list of questions, and I, also they apply to you, Lucas. Um, oh, yes. What do you think is the opinion you hold or, like, the thing you do that's weird that people judge you for the most but that you think is, like, 100% reasonable? Ooh. Like, for me, it's that I think, I'll, to give an example, yeah. I think those videos that are, like, you know, you know those TikTok videos that are, like, uh, to whoever gets him next, and it's these 13-year-old girls, like, crying about their ex-boyfriends, and it's very weird. I kind of think they're cute. <laughs> oh. It's a toxic opinion, but I kind of think they're cute. Yeah, it's, it's I, think it, I think I can understand why that's cute. You know, it's, like, people, it's, like, kids who are, beginning to understand like how romantic dynamics work and they're and they're doing something that's probably they might cringe at later on but it's relatively harmless and it's kind of sweet because yeah i can see that being cute yeah that's not too bad yeah it's cute as cute you know yeah i'm trying to think like i would say for me it's it's very different but i i hate chocolate strawberries i think chocolate is great and i think strawberries are great but i hate them together i just i don't like berries and dairy products mixed i just chocolate mind, covered it, strawberries, strawberries you mean yes chocolate covered strawberries what did i say the first time chocolate strawberry covered strawberries chocolate. oh yeah which well, I, I, okay. I guess is the same thing but it's just not a <laughs> phrase i'd ever heard yeah no, I ha- absolutely yeah. Hate. <laughs> i'm trying no i need i want to think of something do people really get on your ass though about like fucking lucas hates chocolate covered strawberries <laughs> i can see that like, honestly like the sherry's berries like advertising, <laughs> like, but Lucas hates them. Fucking hates <laughs> strawberries. Don't advertise this guy. He's not our demographic. God damn it! I'm really like, trying. They to... big, yeah, they have this big I'm chocolate trying... strawberry place in the in like Rockefeller Center, right? Where they're like mm-hmm. making it outside for, for tourists to walk by. Mm-hmm. And they're like, like, Lucas fucking hates these. these <laughs> <laughs> We're doing this just to spite Lucas. Walk by us, we fucking dare you. <laughs> Don't be like Lucas. Don't be like Lucas. <laughs> Buy the strawberries. <laughs> just making a cross with it, just like repelling me. Um, I, I think for, I think for um, me, uh, a lot, a lot of people. They, it's not that they that like think it's um, judging, but they they take note of it. Is that uh, I'm too uh, like people think I'm fake. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Like like okay in, in in I will in the fight way, them like like, it's, like in the way that like I'm when I'm meeting people I'm too like uh, smiley and laughy, which 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 just people told me like oh you're a little too like uh, laughy feely is that making sense? Uh, That's just being polite. You're just trying to be a, yeah, a generous and, person. And, like I thought like oh because like I'm mostly an uncomfortable person right like in, I mean I'm uncomfortable in most situations so like I you know I like relieving the tension, at least for myself. So I like, you know, being smile laughing. So that's something I've been trying to work on, just try to be like more, I don't know. Mean? What the fuck are these people <laughs> yeah. on about? I would say the word unapologetic. I think that's a good word. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, that's true. But I, I would never call you fake in a million years. Never, 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 never. Well, I, I guess it's not like fake, but it's more like uh, you're more, uh, First impression is kind of too positive. I don't. 
That's also that's, insane. Oh, yeah, but that, that, that yeah. sounds like the, I'm, I work too hard at a job interview, right? Um. <laughs> <laughs> my, my terrible thing is I'm too perfect. It's too perfect for this job. <laughs> it is such a flaw. <laughs> no, but I understand. There is like, sometimes you meet a person and you're like, oh, there's no way they're really like this. Not that I've ever felt that way about you personally. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember what my first impression of you was actually um funny but hilarious i feel like i just really enjoyed being around you actually i oh, was like oh that's really alex kim what a... i i think i had what those people had meeting you but in reverse where like instead of being like oh this guy has a positive attitude what a jerk i was like this guy has a positive attitude that's so nice it's very very refreshing no, Alex, I was instantly just drawn to you as a person. I remember just, just seeing you at open mics and just thinking, I want to introduce myself to this person. This is someone I want to say hi to and tell that I yeah. like his jokes. I just, I, I was, it was just, it was very easy for me. I always, yeah. Yeah. And like, I really, I really appreciate when people come out to me because, uh, and like reach out because I can never do that. Like, I'm so insecure when it comes to like my comedy and like meeting people that like, especially if I bomb, I just zip out as soon as I can. Right. And when, and when people want to, you know, you know, stop me for a second and say what they enjoy, it's like, it, it really means so much. Uh, that's, why, that's why I didn't know that, like, I could get such a, you know, good feeling from doing open mics. But yeah. 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 I, I actually just did think of something <clears throat> that's a little more interpersonal than chocolate covered strawberries. Um, and this, I, you guys might even disagree with me on this, which is totally fine, but I, I, it really sticks in my mind when I see people at open mics that just do their few minutes and then immediately leave. I remember them and they're like on a, a bit of a shit list for me because in my mind, you are to go to an open mic is to, is you're there to, I don't believe that you should be on stage if you wouldn't want yourself as an audience member. Yeah. Hmm. Basically. And so when I see people <clears throat> and like, if I have like an obligation, or like an early morning the next day or something. If I have some reason that I need to leave, then I'll leave. Yeah. Um, but generally, I try to stay as long as I can at an open yeah. mic to be an audience. And I, and and most of the time, like people like stay for a while. And but like, but there are certain people that I have noticed that consistently just leave like a yeah. couple minutes after their set, and that really sticks in my mind and it really bothers me because I think, how do you sleep at night? Like. <laughs> How, how do you live with yourself? Like, that's how I yeah. think. Just like. I will fucking murder you in your sleep if you leave this call and I'm shot. very harsh. I'm very, very harsh with like social standards of stuff. I, so yeah, that's something. You know, they call you harsh Lucas. Yeah, they do. <laughs> no, I, I get it. That's their last like, words. Does, yeah. Yeah. It does suck when you're like up last and there's like four people in the audience. So, exactly. Like, like, yeah. Like I've done that a lot. Um, so I know how much it sucks. It's like, you that, you know. I think as long as you just don't try to make a habit, like, like there, yeah, you're, I agree, there are guys who are just, I, in my mind, known as people who uh, just leave right after the set. Yeah. And like, if you don't make a habit of it, I understand if you leave, but like, you're consistently leaving. I, it, I do remember their faces. But yeah. Alex, how do you do it with, because I remember in the before, you went to a lot of mics. Um, you were like kind of a mic king, which I love. Um, <laughs> But how did you do it in such a way? Because I feel like when people do those like crazy open mic mm -hmm. runs where they go to like 16 a week or something, they have to time it in so far yeah. as like, you know, every host, you like message them before you're like, I want to go this time. They leave mm -hmm. right after their set and try and go to the next thing. Yeah. So like, how did you do it without ever? Because I don't recall you ever being that guy who had to like leave right yeah. after his set. Because I, I would do a lot of the hour-long mics that would like start at five to end at six, and right. then come to another one. Uh, but yeah, uh, yeah, early on I wouldn't I wouldn't do that just because I just feel a lot of pressure to stay because like you're watching me and you know. Uh, I did do that. I did do that to uh, Divya's mic though, just because we're we're buds. So I did kind of abuse that and use that relationship too much. <laughs> but that was the only mic I would like. But even still, I would at least wait for like the group and, or the, and the next group to finish, you know? Yeah, that yeah, makes I sense. Did, yeah. that, I mean, I, 
There is something I weirdly like that you're exploiting your relationships for something very selfish. I was gonna I, make the same some comment. Reason, I like actually, that. I, I really gonna, like that. What are friends if not to exploit them? Exactly. Yeah. Hello. Like there's, a, there's a host who I won't mention who just says like, you don't need to sign up. Just come over. I'm like, thanks. Oh yeah, totally. And I'm, I'm st- I and still feel really that. bad. I'm like, like, I will not, I will not, but. What do you think now that like, so I feel like you started to host fire starters like pretty soon after you started doing it. Do you think your opinion on like open mic comedy, both like in person and on Zoom, has changed now that you like host, like create your own room and moderate your own room? That's a good yeah, question. Yeah, like, uh, yeah, so I really connect with other people who host mics uh, because it's really a thankless job. Uh, totally thankless. Yeah. yeah. But it would be weird if it was a thank job. It would be weird Thank-ful, if people were, yeah. oh my God, thank you so much yeah, for hosting this open yeah. mic. <laughs> Yeah, if we're getting flowers sent to us, like, you hosted that. I'm like, okay, whoa. You're, you're Lucky to get fan on. mail for just hosting an open. Yeah. I'd put a restraining order out. I feel like, like I'd okay. rather that job be thankless. Like, no thing. back. <laughs> Someone does a painting of you creating a Google Doc. <laughs> if someone needs to erect a monument and a statue for this mic. Like, if there are any fan artists out there, I would love for someone to draw me and Alex Kim like at 11 at night, like crying and creating a spreadsheet, yeah. like really tired. <laughs> Fingers covered in like Dorito dust, like. <laughs> it's just bags under the eyes. <laughs> no, yeah, when someone a comic tells me that they host a, a mic, I'm like, oh, like you're, you're like, you feel, you feel this pain, right? You feel, right. Uh, mm. Because, you know, because uh, you're there the entire night, right? You got to keep up yeah. a little bit of energy. I mean, it's, I mean, that's why uh, Firestar is honestly, like, when it was in person, it was, like, such a uh, in reinvigorating, like, it, it charged my batteries, you know, every time I posted that. But it, it is, it was exhausting. Um, yeah, Firestar is a really, really fun mic in person. And it's fun virtually, but it was, it was super fun in person. Yeah. I remember it could just... At some point, Mike's feel like seeing all your, like, cousins in a room, and, like, some of the cousins yeah. you like and some of them you don't like, but for the most part, you like everyone. And mm-hmm. it's just, like, you know, I always used to say it's, like, it's, like, a, I'm around a room of my first cousins, except none of them took seven years to graduate ASU, <laughs> which is one of, <laughs> one of my first cousins did. But regardless, it's, like, your mic specifically, I feel like you cultivated like a really nice, just supportive, warm energy. And I do think there's a way to do that without like laughing at like every joke and yeah. being like an overly supportive mic, which I don't think is good. I think you mm-hmm. and Divya struck like a really good balance there. That's wonderful. Uh, I think it might be a good idea to say for the listeners and viewers exactly what Firestarters is and what makes it special. Yes, Absolutely. Oh, me? Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. Next. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be great if I was the one to explain it, never having been and not being the audience it's for? <laughs> so there's this mic called Firestarters. You guys can be quiet, and I'll take it from here. Um, Let the straight so man there are these, do it. There are these people the called queer people, and... <laughs> and okay. women. Ugh. <laughs> Boring. Snoresville. <laughs> Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, it's, it's just a, it, it's a open mic that's only for uh, women and LGBTQIA plus uh, people and comics. Uh, it's, it was at Eastville Comedy Club in Brooklyn, and me and David Gunasekaran are the co-hosts, and it's every, once every week, and yeah, it's uh, just one of those few uh, queer mics that, you know, has, has a um, really great community that I didn't even know was out there. Yeah, it's awesome. Alex, how do you like, how would you say you adjust your material to different audiences? Because I feel like you're one of the comics who I've seen like do the best job with that. Uh, like, like, uh, like change the material? I don't know I've... if you change it or like, um, I don't know if you've just finagled it, like change your performance in such a way when you see the crowd different or like change up your set list. Like what do you do? Uh, yeah, yeah, I definitely do take in like, who like even open mics like who I'm performing to, um, like when it's at other queer mics, I feel so so much more relaxed and like able to try out new things, um, and like less nervous if I mess up because uh, you know they're, they're like my friends, 
but like other other mics where it's not like that and like I'm in more in the minority uh I have to stick I stick more to the script and like I, I like I write everything out in my material but yeah it's less it's less uh um, easy going I'd say right I no I, I agree with that yeah there's one thing I wanted to say is that I I don't know I haven't seen you Alex perform it everywhere you've ever performed but I've seen you perform at a number of different places and I don't get the feeling that you're someone who like caters for a specific crowd or uh, shaves away parts of you that wouldn't match the crowd I when I what I get a sense of you is someone who like has worked on their material so strongly and knows who they are so well that you're just confident to do it in whatever audience you're from. That's the that's the impression I get, and it's something I really admire about oh, you. Thank, and thank, your I think like for for mics, I I I feel I do. Uh, I try to be more. I I'm, I'm, I'm different, but like for shows, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, I am very confident in the material, but and, and I try to just you know be present in in the material itself because I you know if I if it makes me laugh, then I think they'll laugh exactly yeah no, that is perfect. true about comedy and if any of our listeners have ever been like oh i want to try comedy like my advice is just like if you have like a sense of humor and find things funny mm -hmm. it's like it's like cooking like if you can eat you can cook i think <laughs> there's a lot of people who seem to think they can't cook it's not true you can cook i feel very passionately about this subject i really believe with all my heart that anyone can cook and i kind of believe that if you're like an empathetic and like open enough person you can also do comedy like i really believe the only people who can't do comedy are like humorless assholes and even them sometimes they can be funny, yeah. <laughs> they can be funny unfortunately yeah. they like work on the i don't like seeing them at mics i like know yeah. who they are yeah. but <laughs> i, I I yeah. think more than anything, what shines is the fact that you put effort into something. Like, even like uh, whether it's like cooking or comedy, like you can tell, even if it's not like a perfect bit, you can tell that's when someone has put effort into it and they're really trying to find structure. And that is something I always respect. Even if it's not immediately funny, I think I want to pay attention to this person because I see they're putting work into it. And that always, that always attracts me to uh, anyone of any medium. But yeah. Because that is something I also noticed at um, a couple of shows that I did in February is that I wouldn't say that I was the funniest person on the lineup in like a couple of shows, but I do think I was one of the people that put in the most effort into their set because I noticed a lot of people that it felt like they were just trying out sort of half-baked ideas. They were just sort of doing stuff on the fly in a way that just was, it wasn't riffing. It was actually unprepared. And it was, it was, and it was something that really, I, I just remember being aware of that. Um, I actually remember something very similar. I first tried comedy in like 2014. It wasn't until recently I like was doing it, doing it, but I like tried comedy. I took a comedy writing class at Caroline's and I got on their new talent showcase and I was like so nervous. It was my first time going up at a real comedy club and this guy this like older new york guy comes up to me he's like first time and i was like yeah i'm so nervous and he's like don't worry about it like i'm going up there and i've got nothing prepared no material and you know he was this older like new york like savant so i was like oh my god this guy must be amazing like he must be such a genius he goes up and he was not lying like he had absolutely no material he started ranting. You could hear a pin drop with silence in the room. <laughs> and the host went on stage after him and went, all right, well, that guy was having a stroke. And the room just fucking <laughs> broke into laughter. It was crazy. Yeah. So I guess never trust anyone who, does, who says, like, oh, I don't prepare. Because they literally don't prepare. <laughs> that is hilarious. Oh, that's something, like, out of the office. Like, someone who, like... Someone who like thinks they're an expert at something, but they have no expertise. Yeah. That's beautiful. Oh my <laughs> really God, that's was. so funny. Um, oh. Alex, do you have any like crazy like first times doing comedy? Like, yes. how did you, how did you find your way into stand up? I'm very curious. Well, um, well, like, it's like uh, first time in a stand up, I was in high school. I did it once for like this talent show. And I did like four minutes. First joke, I got laughs. The rest of them were just like just straight observations that like people like nodding at and like 
it was at my school, so people were like supportive, right? But then I then I didn't touch stand up until I came, until I finished college and then came to New York. Um, but like I thought I'd want to stand up for like a long time. What was what was you know? Because I've always been like watching those clips on YouTube, you know, sharing with my sharing with my friends. Uh, I just never thought of it like, oh, I could do that, right? You gotta, what is that path? Um, but what really got me into it was when I was, I watched Seinfeld like a lot as a kid, like so much. And it was those stand up clips in between that, like, like I have those same kinds of thoughts. And like, like if I can make it funny, like I think I could do this guy because I have those thoughts. Why don't I try to do that? So, like, starting from then, I like when I was in high school, I would just t- I start a notebook of like funny things that I thought and and like I you know had material I was building up throughout the college never performed it but like just kept a, a notebook of it and then it took me two years after I graduated college to be like maybe I'll go to sign up for this thing called laughing Buddha I don't know what this is called oh. and, I'll, <laughs> and I'll try it and, and that, that's what happened well, I'll, I'll avoid too much commentary on that part of it, but that is awesome that eventually you got into it just like, be, it, like no. you, it's almost like you were hoarding this part of your brain that's like, I'm doing this creative path, like, even yeah. though I'm not actively pursuing it right now, these thoughts are in my head and eventually they're going to metabolize into something, which shows like you had a lot of mm-hmm. faith in yourself. Well, the, the thing is, though, like, I think it took me so long because, you know, there were stand-up shows in when I was in college and the people were doing it. I just never, uh, the thing is, it was because I was never, I never believed that I could do it. Like, I don't think I ever, growing up, I was like, oh, I can follow my dreams, you know, because that, that is crushed away when you're very young in my house, you know, they make sure to crush all dreams. Uh, so, so I just, I just knew I wanted to do this, but it, it only took me, like, it took me like years to like, why don't I just freaking do this? May I ask how they crushed all dreams? With like, the mallet? Press press or... <laughs> <laughs> a mincer? <laughs> just put a blender and like fed it to us. <laughs> uh, at no, least no, you that. No. I would want my dream seasoned at the very least. <laughs> it was just water and dreams. <laughs> Maybe some ice. Maybe I if did, you're lucky. I actually did though a... I kind of really, I did a very similar thing in that even though I wasn't pursuing stand up since I was 14, I started just the process of taking mm-hmm. notes because I feel like I was just, I had the sense I was like, I feel like I might pursue this one day and I would want to start get in the habit of doing this. And then like in college, I also tried it very barely. I, I joined this group called the comedy forum that met up on Sundays and it was in like a circle that they would like try out material. And it just filled me with so much anxiety. I just, I couldn't. Yeah. I couldn't do it. And I was just, um, and then I started doing therapy and then I did that class to Caroline's that you did, uh, yeah. Gabby. And then I did, and that's how I started. But yeah, it was very yeah. similar and sort of starting off slowly and working my way up. No, that reminds me, I uh, uh, auditioned for a sketch comedy group in college, like two different ones. And I failed both auditions. It was so bad. It was so embarrassing. It's like, okay, I guess comedy is not a thing for no. me. No. What what ever sketch comedy? Yeah, exactly. Well, that woman was Tina Fey. (laughs) (laughs) Like, like that's my Michael Jordan story. Like, he was not accepted wherever high school football team. Oh yeah, wasn't he like cut from the basketball team? (laughs) Who said that? But But there is something. No, go. No, go on. I was saying like you. So what really kicked it like started because like what really uh I think started uh. Uh, started comedy for me was that I was not good at anything else like I was not good in school like I could not I was very not focused and like I knew that you know education was not for me right so like I think if I I found something I liked I would have kept that but it's because I had no validation like in school in college like I I need to find something else right but what really pushed it was when it was actually during a breakup and I had less time I had more time with myself I was like why don't I just finally do this, right? I'm sad and I don't know what to do with my life. I should just do, I should try stand up. And it was because of that breakup that I did that first uh, open mic. Wow, did oh, you do wow. breakup material? No, I did my uh, like weird high school observations. <laughs> <laughs> it is 
isn't it crazy that there's letters in the math? Teachers. <laughs> and that's and just crazy. the mask you put on to hide the pain. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh I love that. Um, that is Alex, so sweet. do you do you have any pet peeves? Um, like, like recently, the pet peeves have, are, they do come out like when I'm at comedy, like like when I notice people leaving stuff like that, right? Uh, but you know, like I also find that I'm sometimes too judgmental, and like that's something I've been trying to work on. Like like in my mind, my immediate like my knee jerk reaction is to like hate everyone, right? It's so, like I don't know, hate irritates me. Then like I got like that's just I don't know why I always feel that. So I'm always trying to like. It's just feeling you feeling that now, and so whenever I, I have, really like, want to see more of this side of you because it's it's not what I see on the surface, and I want I want the I want I want the creature I inside want Alex. Bitchy Alex. No, because no, 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 it's it's because like it's like what you said, Lucas. When I when I when I'm seeing stand up and I see that someone is ill prepared, I get I I get irrationally like upset when like should I should really shouldn't care. Like I really feel like I shouldn't be this like hemped up emotion about it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but like I get those a lot and I try to be like just more no just everything's gonna be fine Alex I do have a question so something that I judge people a lot is when they have bad manners or if they're if they're existing in a way that it's clear they're not thinking about how they're affecting other people, yeah. whether they're making noise or they smell, whatever. Just like, I care very much about like not yeah. bothering people around me. And so when I see someone who isn't doing that, I think I, I'm almost a little bit jealous because I think, how did you make it this far? You're so lucky. You made it this far. Your parents obviously didn't punish you for this. They weren't writing your ass about your manner. And I'm jealous that they, they have that freedom of, of, being essentially yeah. i was wondering do you feel like a similar thing where you're almost jealous that they feel so entitled or free or whatever yeah you know there, there's a there's a korean word for that it's, it's for like the it means, it's nunchi. it means like the atmosphere or, or, mm. and the people's ability to read the room right and to, mm. and to like have that shared mind uh so like people who don't have that they don't have nunchi they're always like outcasted um and I so like yeah, this. whenever because and I see I have a lot of personal pressure of like making sure that you know I don't stick out. I'm like everything's fine. I don't. I'm not a cause of pretension uh, when I do stand up. <laughs> but but like yeah, when people are just don't have that sense, I'm like I'm always shocked at like oh my god, that's which takes so much like non caring about you know how people think about you, and I, I'm always jealous of like, that ability to uh, just not care what people think because they don't care. They really don't care. I've always been jealous of that quality. To, I've been jealous for a long time at the ability to be unabashedly bad at something and like unashamed. Cause I feel like I mm. had that, like uh, people say this and it's such a cliche, but like quote unquote gifted kid thing where like, if I wasn't immediately good at something, I would just put it down and it's not benefited me during my life because it's yeah. just made me a fucking weakling. And then you yeah. see people, uh, comedians posting their fucking bad tweets that get one like to Instagram <laughs> and like putting up clips that's like, isn't it weird when a boy kisses you and he doesn't have a bed? Like, and I'm like, you just are doing this and you don't care and you don't care about being judged or like yeah. laughed at or wronged and it's just so cool like i want it yeah. i there want there's a beauty to that for sure i love when people are unabashedly bad at yeah. things because also the other thing is it I, i've i've come to realize this when someone's bad at something it doesn't affect my life it doesn't affect yeah. me it's like someone it's like it's like what um the the supreme court needs to know about like being gay or being trans it's like well it doesn't fucking affect you move on so it's like someone being bad at something i used to be like oh my god how does this person not know they're bad i've stopped because it's like you know what not my problem not my problem someone else will tell that person and also why do they need to know if if your goal is not to be famous but to just make art then you will make art however which way you want to make it and if you're bad at it no one needs to tell you you're bad at it that was something yeah. that i really that was something i really liked about the disaster artist i don't know if you guys oh that. yeah i love yeah. that book actually oh i haven't read the book um but there is something beautiful about that that 
it was just like the actors like at lunch they were just talking about they were like this movie's fucking weird you know but there was this woman it was an older woman who, who plays like the woman who gets breast cancer in the room, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the mom. <laughs> yeah, the mom. And she was just talking about like, you know, like when she was just saying something very simple about like getting up in the morning and knowing you're about to go to set and do the thing you love. And it was just like, it was just such a simple, beautiful joy she was talking about that it wasn't about how good something was, but just the fact that they were doing it and they were doing it. It was just, it was something very beautiful and heartwarming about it. That thing was really the center of the movie. Um, it was just uh, the joy of creating something. It was, yeah. So you're yeah. a bad person, Gabby, for getting mad at people. That's what I'm <laughs> oh saying. My God. Well, I used to, I definitely, that was a big breakthrough in comedy, like realizing basically exactly what you said, which is like, I feel like I used to really freak out. Like, oh, does this joke land? Oh, am I going to bomb at this mm-hmm. mic? Now I'm like, I don't care because at least someone got to hear it. You know, people got to... People sat there for five minutes and they listened and no, they didn't laugh, but that's okay because they got to hear me do it. Yeah, see, see, that's where like, I feel I want to get to because I feel like a lot of the means I talk to, they're like, they're hustlers, right? Like they're, kinda, they're like doing exactly, doing as much as they can to you know, get those hours in, get those shows and those spots. And like, I, whenever I see that, I'm always like insecure about like, oh, should I be doing more? Am I not pursuing my dream? hard enough you know like if i if i'm not working that hard like am i act do i actually care like, I don't, like to get to that point where i'm like yeah i got laughs but i'm doing it you know that's that's like the end goal to get to that point well that's the the strangest thing about any craft whether you're like a chef or a me- i don't know why i keep talking about cooking probably i'm hungry or like a me- mechanic <laughs> I'm or, too now. or whatever it's like when you can get to that point of just like I don't know, there will always be people who are like, you're not doing this right because you don't have this thing or this title or you need to do more of this or that. And if you can just cut the bullshit aside and be like, well, I'm going to do the thing I like to do and I'm going to enjoy it and I'm going to do it for me and I'm going to do it in a way that I think is elevating my craft. I think that's, I don't know, that's what creates personal happiness and fulfillment. I guess Mm -hmm. not that I'm the expert on that because I do take 10 milligrams of Prozac a day to get here, but (laughs) here we are. Yay for taking your medication. (laughs) Um, But in that vein, I, I, I I totally do the exact same thing of thinking, am I doing enough? Am I hustling hard enough? Am I push? But there is something that I will never, that I always will respect for myself for is that I don't wish that I started stand up earlier than I did. And I have heard comedians say um, that they wish they started like 10 years earlier or something like that. And I started last year when I was 24 and I don't wish I started any time before or after because it was right at the perfect point. I also think that I had better writing skills right at that point than I did when I was in college. Like when I was, I was just, I definitely wasn't, I was, I I definitely feel like I was worse. Um, But then also just like my own confidence and anxiety stuff, it was just, Everything was very, for me personally, it was very perfectly aligned for me to start when I did. And I don't regret the timing one bit. Yeah, like, I think about that a lot. Like I, for a long time, thought like always, you know, kick myself for wishing I started earlier. Like, why didn't I just, as soon as I moved to New York, why didn't I just start, right? Hmm. Um, instead of waiting like two, three years. Um, but I agree. But now, just recently, I've been, you know, I've been seeing we seeing more younger comics. I'm like, oh my God, that would have been me. Like, just, mm-hmm. I think it would have taken still, if I started when I was 20, to, to, to mature and like, just stop doing like cum jokes, you know, for like years. And, and you, to actually form a, a voice and a character. So I think like, I think even if I started earlier, I would still be about the same level as a comedian. than if I yeah. started a little later. Yeah. Well, you need in life, you need life experience. Like, for example, I went to this, you know, dramatic arts high school. And I really believe the reason I was not a good actor at 14 was because I was not a fully developed person. Mm -hmm. I was very depressed. I had been very traumatized recently. I just wanted to, like, 
yell and scream and I was not like a naturalistic actor I also had no control over like my body like I was this gawky lanky little thing like I kind of mushroomed out <laughs> later in life but when I was like 18 I st started like suddenly kind of getting good at acting but but by that time no one would look at me because when I was 14 I was no good so they'd already like put me in this bubble and it's like for young comedians it's like if you start super young your shtick kind of becomes that you're young but you might not yeah. have like any life experience to back up like the yeah. things yeah. you're saying unless you're a completely clairvoyant person which I, yeah. unless you're that so raven like <laughs> telling the future and yeah. shit you can't do there that. are there are exceptions to every rule like you know pete davidson started when he was a teenager and he was yeah. really funny there's also a scottish comedian called daniel sloss who started when he was like 17 and he's like he has multiple specials now he just like kept getting better and better and so like there's definitely merit in trying it when you're no, young for sure and yeah. having and giving yourself room to fail or be wildly successful but that but i think there's also enormous merit for just like listening to your body and giving yourself time and not feeling like you're under any obligation to start at some point, just not rushing yourself. And so, so yeah. yeah. I do know when I was younger, I tried it and I was like 20. And so I always thought I was like the youngest comedian in the room. I was like, so I was like, oh, I'm this prodigy, you know, 20 years old in stand up. <laughs> and then once I, I got on this like bringer show and I was 20 and there was a kid there who was 14, who was like the 14 year old comedian. And I was like, and I bombed because I was so mad that I wasn't like the young visionary comedian Aww. anymore. Because obviously there was a 14 year old child making jokes his mother wrote for him. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Yeah, I actually well, remember. No, Alex, go ahead. I was gonna ask, like, how, like, how do you guys like, uh, like, have that balance? Because, like, because because it's creative, right? You could always, like, I find myself like, I should be writing. I should be doing something. But I'm like, I have my weekend. I just want like some time. Like, I should, I should be out there doing more and writing. Because I could, I could write every second. But, like, how do you guys find that balance of like not stressing yourself out and not being down on yourself, as a, and then just then doing it at a pace that's good for you. That's a very good question. I wish I had an answer. <laughs> I think I, I have an answer, which is that I just don't get booked that often. <laughs> and I, I, and I say that because in in March, which is conveniently when coronavirus lockdown happened, I started realizing I was like, oh, people get on these shows because they ask. You know, I would look at lineups and I'd be like, wait, that comedian's like kind of like at my level or like my friend or someone I've seen before who's to say I can't get on that show so I just asked the booker I'd be like hey do you want another comedian they'd be like okay and I was like oh shit okay so I could just hustle and ask to be on this show or whatever so I got booked on all these shows in March and that was like when it all shut oh. down but I don't know that like being booked all the time or like writing all the time actually makes you a better comedian what makes you a better comedian I think is like doing it as often as you can um and also giving yourself time and space to like live life so you can get material from life yeah because if you're just sitting there writing what are you gonna what are you gonna write material about your notebook like yeah not that I'd i don't have a joke about my notebook because i do <laughs> <laughs> and i love that joke but oh, yeah classic. I would it's sort of like relationships. You need to like take care of yourself first before you can take care of other people. And I think it's the same with stand up is that you have to be able to serve your own needs, you know, have time to relax, get out in nature, exercise, make tasty, healthy food or whatever. And like you have to do all of that stuff first. And with what you have left over, organize yourself away where you, with what you have left over to devote that into whatever you're passionate about. Um, and but just never. Well, mm -hmm you're always going to overextend yourself every now and again, but generally try to not make it a habit. Basically. That's what I'm trying. I'm not good at it though. I've, I have a big problem with saying no to people when someone says like, Oh, do you want to like come on this like uh, live stream? Or you want to do this show? Can do you want to, I, I immediately think, Oh, I have to do it. I, I immediately feel like I have an obligation to do it. And I'm still wrestling with that. Trying. Yeah, to I mean, I mean, that's that. why I'm here basically. Well, if you said no, we would have peer pressured you. Until you said yes. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't <laughs> want it. Would have been like, Alex, come on. We need a comedian with good skin. <laughs> Alex, come on. You know you want to come on our podcast. Just do it. Just cancel everything else in the day. 
<laughs> yeah, it's gonna be an all day recording, twelve hours. Yeah. Buckle Everything up, else. bitch. <laughs> or you're canceled. <laughs> uh, shall we go to um some uh submissions? Yes, we should, and I have one right so here. Better. Beautiful. Actually. Do the oh, thing. Oh, Alex, I'm so excited to hear your perspective on some of these. Okay, so this one, um, I never know who they're from. They basically just come to us as like a, just for the listeners. Um, it's like Yik Yak. Understand. Oh my God, Yik Yak. Whoa. We Alex, are- was, there, was there Yik Yak at Cornell? Yeah, yeah, there was. And then it, then it went away. <laughs> Same at my college. We need to advertise ourselves as the Yik Yak of the podcast world. That is so true. Oh my God. Go on, Gabby, go on. When I was in middle school, I spent a summer at an all girls sleepaway camp. Okay, already juicy. I didn't think I would like it because all the other kids were from very sheltered, ultra religious communities. So I couldn't talk to them about comic books or video games. But I had a great time, except for the time my mom wrote to me that Robin Williams had died and no one knew who he was. Most of my bunk mates were from suburban communities made up of only Orthodox Jews, and most of them were grandkids of Holocaust survivors. This is a funny story, I promise. One night, (laughs) that's the funniest line right there. (laughs) One night, my bunk mates and I snuck out in the middle of the night and decided to explore the forest behind the river where rumor had it there were some caves. We found the caves, and since I was the oldest and tallest of the bunch, I was nominated to explore one. Armed with only a flashlight, I entered. I like the idea, just to interrupt quickly, that they were like, all right, well, let's put the tall girl in this cave, because nothing would happen <laughs> to tall people. <laughs> if there's a cave in, it'll hit her head first. Like... <laughs> <laughs> no. we owl, we'll know. I walked for a while and realized this wasn't a spooky, spooky cave. It was just a weird man-made tunnel under a hill. No cobwebs or no. bats, just a clear dirt path. I finally rounded a corner and found the other end of the tunnel. There were four or five teenagers hanging out, obviously high, and a dog. The kids didn't notice me, but the dog did. He started barking, and I ran off. I ran to my bunk mates, and we all took off, and we didn't stop running until we were out of the forest. They all started asking what those weird howls were, but I was so out of breath. All I could say was dog. They all started freaking out, whispering about the mad dog that haunts the cave. I couldn't figure out why they were so spooked, and then it hit me. They still thought it was a cave, not a tunnel. Uh, whatever was in there had entered the same way I did. They had never seen a dog before. Domesticated what? animals aren't common in the communities these girls were from, so they knew people owned dogs, but probably had never met one who had. And remember how their grandparents were mostly survivors? The Nazis used dogs to hunt people down! <gasps> so these girls know some people own dogs, but more importantly, dogs sometimes hunt cues. Oh. So there I was in a creepy cave, staring down a terrifying monster with no other way to escape. No wonder they were so spooked. I probably should have just told them all what really happened, but all I could think was, how the hell am I going to explain pot to these squares? (laughs) (laughs) So I didn't say anything. So now there's a full-blown legend at that camp about the beast that haunts the cave in the forest. According to my friend, who eventually became a camp counselor there, only one girl has ever seen the beast. And rumor has it that she's now a whisper voice homosexual. So stay out of the forest unless you want to end up bisexual like me. Okay, well that was a twist ending. I didn't expect didn't expect this to be a coming out bisexual story. <laughs> I <laughs> Oh my god. Do you know what this weirdly made me think of is that I saw like there's a hypothesis that the reason why a lot of mammals are afraid of reptiles is because like primordial rodents ran away from dinosaurs. And so is that instinct to run away from these giant reptiles why is the reason why we're a little bit averse to them now. And so I, and so I immediately thought if there was some like epigenetic thing of like being afraid of dogs with these descendants of Holocaust survivors. (laughs) This reminds me of that thing of like, they just see like white people don't kiss their dogs on the mouth and like like people like mm-hmm. in black communities like freak out they're like why are they kissing that dog like i don't understand just like it is interesting to think that mm-hmm. like not everyone has the same relationship to domesticated animals like in every community yeah. like it kind yeah. of is pretty weird that we all just keep our dogs on leashes and just they just bark and we just all deal with it you know 
I just, I'm just trying to imagine like a shell, like a sheltered. Fa- I can't imagine a world where I've never seen a dog. You know. Then again, George R. R. Martin, who wrote like the Game of Thrones books, uh, Song of Ice and Fire, he doesn't know he when he started writing those books, he didn't know what a horse looked like. Because in his descriptions of horses in the books, like the the man mounted the shell on the horse on the horse's back, and they <laughs> the sh- and it was like, and he mentioned like a lot of other things that aren't part of horses, like, <laughs> and it's sort of like this weird internet like sort of cult theory thing that he just doesn't know, that he didn't know what a horse looked like early on in writing the books. Oh, that's so interesting. Is that your buzzer? Sorry, Alex? it might have been mine. I'm not sure. Oh, okay. Is that, is that, is that like time's up? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I had a you timer off. in the back the whole time. <laughs> yeah. Okay, wait. Uh, this isn't necessarily a submission on the Google. Okay, for anyone who's listening, who's new to the podcast, hello and welcome. Uh, there is a Google form that you can uh, fill out for us if you have a, uh, a neurosis, a habit, a fear, an interest, uh, an odd sexual awakening or something, or a fun story like this. Any kind of good dirt and juicy stuff, uh, you can submit it to us on this Google form. Uh, that is, uh, you can find the link through our Instagram, at Two Nosy Meerkats on all social media. And we would love to hear from you. Um, but this is someone who actually reached out to me on... Um, on Instagram, and I asked for permission to share this, and I got it. And this is what this person said. Uh, hey, I absolutely love your content, but I had this weird nightmare with you in it. I don't know if it's a trigger for you, but gun shoot, gun slash shooting warning. I was with my boyfriend, question mark, in his bedroom. We were hanging out and chatting about going to the mall soon and going for the dentist. Uh, while speaking, the front door rung. I opened up my phone to look at the security camera and there you were, me, Lucas, with a gun. And and so this person said, you say, me, you say you are coming to kill us. I instantly hide in my closet. My boyfriend arms himself, but is quickly bested. You come into the closet where I am. You let yourself loose your gun to me when I try fighting back against you. You quickly pull out another gun and run off. I open the front door, but then hide in the basement. And then I woke. Uh, Weird ass dream. I know, I know. Hope you don't plan to murder me and my partner. Have a lovely day. (laughs) Someone wants you to come over and like... (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, this rip, is a sex fulfillment yeah, dream of some rip, kind. Whip it out and point at her. I just like want to get murdered. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, also, does she have a boyfriend or will, will, uh, or was it a boyfriend? Yeah, what was the question me? mark? That's a good it, point. I have no <laughs> idea. I was with my boy I think you know sometimes in a dream like you have a feeling you're in this room but you're not sure if it's actually that room. I'm wondering if maybe this person had a feel that they were with a person in their dream. Uh, and there wasn't sure if it was their boyfriend, but probably was, but maybe not sure. I don't know. You, to, to the person who wrote this, um, I'll, I'll say the name, uh, Billy. Uh, you, you, didn't, you didn't need to put a question mark after boyfriend. You could just, just for the sake of the narrative, you could just say it's concretely your boyfriend. <laughs> I appreciate the honesty. My boyfriend, yeah. maybe? So, or yeah, maybe yeah, someone yeah. I've just looked at before? I can't tell. <laughs> um, I have... Go on, Alex, sorry. I was like, you know, I wanted to know if, like, Lucas was in a different voice when he was like, I want to kill you. If you like, if oh. you like heard one of your TikToks and one is like dreaming of a certain voice of yours. <laughs> the John Mulaney voice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, especially that one. Well, oh, motherfucker, I need another clip. I've lost this one. <laughs> Just dumped it all over you and your boyfriend. I mean, that's not, that's no longer nightmare. That's just, that's just a good dream. <laughs> John Mulaney killing someone is weirdly adorable. Yeah, if I were if yeah. I were to be killed, I'd want it to be by John Aww, Mulaney. John yeah. Mulaney, if you're listening. Just yeah, John Mulaney, if you're listening, straight up murder Gabby. She'd love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was gonna say I have a simple one here um, that I think Please we do. might be able to talk about for a while. Yes. Um, I have a hate slash phobia of flirting. I suck at it and literally freeze every time. Tips. Ooh. I'm who who is like the best flirting. flirter? Do you think? I I don't want to say me, but it probably is. Me. I would say you probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd say I'd say yeah. I mean, it's just a feel. I think you'd be the best. Yeah. To me, it comes naturally because I 
kind of prefer to like the only thing i have in this life is just the ability to be kind of charming and i've not been giving too many gifts but i've been giving <laughs> a gift i don't get i don't have much in life i don't have many talents but i look good and people tell me <laughs> what what i think is funniest about this is that my girlfriend has exactly the same thing as I do where she, everyone thinks she's flirting with them and everyone also thinks I'm flirting with them. But it took us three years of being platonic friends to get together because we are both the same kind of people where it's like, I don't know if they're flirting, you know, they could just be being nice. But we both thought that about the other one because we both are flirts who flirt with everyone, but we were actually flirting with each other. So that right. was really crazy. But I do kind of have this demeanor about me where it's like I'm flirting with everyone, but I'm just being nice. So I don't know how to answer this question. I leave this to you guys. I don't know what it's like to have a phobia of flirting. It's my <laughs> MO. I flirt with everyone. It's how I get through like being a seven. Like that's what elevates me to being a 10, honestly. I mean, does it, uh, that was, I would imagine that like, that would cause conflict in relationship, but I guess because you're both like that, it's like understandable. Yeah, because yeah. we're both like that. It and you understand even, each other. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. just like, I, it actually benefits me greatly because like, she has people who flirt with her who like, I bet I could ask them for personal favors, like her reply guys. I bet you like, I could ask like the bartender who served her a drink five years ago to like help me open a storage unit and he would do it. Because <laughs> it's just, that's how people act when two women are in a relationship. They're like, it's not like, you know, if she had a boyfriend, it might be different. I might be a threat but because I'm the girlfriend. It's like, I can just use my little girly charm and just get anything I want as well. Yeah, I just realized, so you, so you flirt with guys and girls? Yes, I flirt with, okay. I, not on purpose, but oh, it's yeah. just what happens, okay? You can't control your charm. Your charm knows no, no gender. No, no bounds, no gender. <laughs> In fact, I think I, guys like me more than girls ever liked me because they can kind of tell I don't like them back, so I'm not wow. nervous. I was, yeah. sometimes I, I, I had occasional attraction to guys and like when I flirted with them, it was just so easy because it was just like, guys are just easy. It's just, they just yeah, walk around and exist and you just like, you're just open with them. Like, hey, I'm flirting with you. They're like, okay, well that was no work for me, which I like, all, so I'm flirting with you All back. guys do, they just, they walk around, they exist, they have penises and they <laughs> eat cheese. That's all they do. <laughs> just. Much What's that it. meme on Twitter? Like, eat hot, ch all bisexuals do is eat hot chip and lie. <laughs> it's all like, all men do is exist and lie. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think I think what I heard from men is, all men do is be 5'7 and lie. Oh my god, <laughs> yes! <laughs> okay, but in terms of, like, flirting, Al Alex, do you have any go-to strategy in terms of, like, flirting? What, what would you say? I, I do not flirt. I have zero experience flirting. I, I mean, like, like when you're, uh, like, I've only interacted with other gay guys on the apps, right? Mm -hmm. And, like, the way you flirt in the club is just, like, you just look at them, right? That's not really translatable in, like, other situations. You just, like, you know, you, 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 yeah, you, you, you face fuck them. That's how you, you signal if you're interested. <laughs> um, and, like, I've never, because I think it goes back to, like, the, the way I, I don't, like, I get really nervous on people. So I don't, I, I get bars. I don't pick people up. I don't, you know, that's just not something I do. Or, yeah. But do you get picked up? Do you like put the charm on to get picked up? Uh, I think I do. But then I, I but then I, I immediately like get scared away, I scare myself away from it. You know what I mean? I'm like, ah, oh, okay, ah. Oh. Like, then I'm like, where are my friends? You know, I, I'm very, very bad at flirting. I, it was actually this, I recently I've started getting like, I started getting like more hit on like, I, like earlier in the year, I was at a friend's birthday and there was a woman at the party who just like, who just asked me out and we went out like the following week. And then I also met someone at, op at an open mic that eventually broke things off, but she just asked me out afterwards on Instagram and that was kind of cool. And then who I'm with now, my girlfriend, we found each other on Bumble. We saw each other and I'm pretty sure I swiped right on her. Uh, but she, um, she, she recognized me from TikTok and she was showing her friend. She was like, oh, it's that dude. And then she was about to swipe right on me, but a glitch happened in the app. And so it then that was lost. 
And so she met, so she commented under one of my videos saying, Hey, you're really great. Also, I just accidentally swiped left on you on Bumble. Uh, and basically just openly going, just like shooting her shot. And then I clicked on her profile. I was like, hold up. I think I recognize her. And then we started talking and so, yeah, but I, so that is something that's very, I, th I would say like modern dating apps have made someone, if you're shy when it comes to flirting, dating apps are a real boon. It's a real good thing to like be able to like, cause I would say most of my anxiety for me was like asking out someone who would say no, just the idea of rejection is just, it's so scary. And so knowing that the only way you can start talking is if you both match is just like, it's such a reliever of tension and anxiety. Cause then you think, oh, okay, we match. Now I can feel comfortable like talking and setting up a time to meet up or whatever. And so, so for this person who's afraid of flirting, I would say there's never been a better time to be afraid of flirting weirdly i would say like <laughs> just like leverage technology now well it depends on how old you are i don't know how old did this person say how old they were they did not all they said was i'm not good at flirting does anyone have any tips right I think, yeah i think we're moving away from flirting <laughs> <laughs> my, my tip is be, be safe get tested don't flirt don't <laughs> <laughs> vet them <laughs> this is the worst time to flirt don't see anyone um yeah, I, well, first off, I would say, like, don't, well, first off, don't judge yourself for being bad at flirting. Like, you are a very, you're, it's a very normal phase to go, th phase to go through. And so, I would say just, like, give yourself time. But, um, but yeah, you kind of just have to, like, put yourself out there in some way. I think the notion, as a, as a person of flirt experience, um, <laughs> Please I speak. think the notion of flirting itself is for in terms of romance is actually sort of a fallacy because flirtation is something that happens when you're like trying to charm someone but it's not like you're necessarily like because no matter how good a flirt you are or whatever if you're smitten with someone like you completely lose your words like you like y y if you're if you find the right person you're not gonna be able to flirt with them no matter what so just trust that you will find the right person and that neither of you will need to flirt because you'll both know, if that makes sense. I mean, that could be in 2028, yeah. you know, or it could be tomorrow, but yeah. you just have to trust it'll eventually happen or don't trust it and just uh, exist. I don't know, but you should probably trust it because it statistically is bound to happen. Yeah. It's also the uh, that... um. If you're someone like me who's like afraid of rejection or afraid of like the flirting not going well, getting comfortable with failure. And that goes with like, that goes with stand up or anything, anything that involves other people's reactions, just get comfortable with the idea of it not going well and realizing it's not the end of the world. It's not going to be a significant memory in the other person's mind. You're not going to burn a bridge or like you're, so yeah, just get comfortable with the idea of failure and then you will be free, I think. And that goes did for a lot guys, of things. Yeah, did, did you guys date in high school? Like a lot? I was in a relationship when I was in high school and I was in for the whole of my junior year. Yeah. How, yeah, how I did, was like, as well. Dude, like, so how did like, cause I've never done it. Like how do high school like, uh, like the, cause you flirt with your classmates sometimes, right? Do like, do those, do those form uh, like, how do those naturally form? I don't know. I, I don't think I naturally... <laughs> I think what would end up happening with me is, like, in high school, you just, you're friends with someone, and then you give them a really long hug, and you're like, whoa, like, that was something. And they're like, oh, never mind, I'll just forget about it. Um, yeah. I mean, my, my high school partner didn't go to my high school. I met them at a summer camp. Um, so that I think is slightly different. And that was just the kind of thing of like, obviously we were attracted to each other. Obviously something was going to happen. It would have been really crazy if it hadn't happened because the attraction was there, which is just how I think all of these things are, you know? Yeah. Now for me and my girlfriend in high school, like uh, we met at the beginning of my sophomore year and we were going to go out, but then I broke it off. I got very, very scared and I was, I wasn't sure how I felt. And then it was towards the end of my sophomore year and like the summer in between. 
sophomore and junior year that we started hanging out more we had like a group of friends that we were all in like one big friend group and it was just like very clear that we were like drawn to each other i would say a very good rule of thumb um is like if you're all sitting out in a park somewhere in the before times um but like if you guys if you're sitting next to each other and your thighs touch and that person doesn't move the thigh away you know, just like the idea of just like a very innocuous point of contact and seeing how the other person reacts. And if they move their weight, then that's fine. But if they I understand there, that you meant the outside thigh, but the outside of the for thigh. some reason, I imagine like the inner, if you're sitting by a person, your inner thigh is touch. I mean, look, <laughs> you like each other. <laughs> I hope. If, you're, if you find yourself grinding up another person, maybe it <laughs> might be a sign. Oh, look, yeah. if you're dry humping, it's clear. <laughs> There's some to it. Maybe she'll if you're fucking, knows? chances are they're into you. <laughs> um, but you know, like, the outer <laughs> thighs. Basically, if your <laughs> legs happen to graze each other and the other person doesn't immediately and kind of lingers there, the linger is a... I would say that's a fairly good sign to, to not like to... But just to like see how things per proceed. Yeah. It's just oh like, God. yeah. You know, when, 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 that just reminded me. I was in high school, and I was like, I was, <laughs> I really liked this one guy, but he was straight, and like our knees touched, but then I kept it there. <laughs> but, like, I just kept, just kept it there. Our bare knees were touching, and I just, I just kept it there. And I like, he didn't move. He, he didn't move. I don't think he thought anything of it though, because. Okay. Uh, but, but the fact is, he didn't move, so... He didn't move. Yeah. He did not move. So, but the thing is, like, I remember you saying that you were, like, straight in high school. Was this person also straight at the time? And so... Yeah, I, I guess so, because he had girlfriends. Hmm. Okay. I mean, what, I mean, well, what, is that? what does that mean? I don't yeah, know. I was going to say, do, when did you first start, like, going on dates, dates? Or, or was it just mostly, yeah. like, hookups for a while? Uh, it was mostly hookups, yeah. I have been very few dates, um... That's the thing. I have had very few hookups. That I I never. I, I'm really... somewhere in between. I think I I don't know. Yeah. I've I've had like a like I could maybe less than ten dates. Mostly hookups. Yeah. Wow. That's still a decent amount of dates. It's like a yeah. a season of Are You the One, <laughs> the reality show. <laughs> if if that's a unit you measure things in, which it is for me. Yeah. But like, if you think about what, what what I think about is the proportion of hookups to dates. It's like very tiny, you know. I get ass is what I'm I saying. See. But uh, <laughs> Ooh, no, damn. Okay, body count. <laughs> oh, I actually I have a question, Alex. What what would you say are priorities for you in maybe just hooking up with someone, or maybe something you want, or someone you want to date? What are a few things that if they do X or they have X quality about them or some that you think, oh, automatic, no, it would just couldn't work out. When someone, like very clearly, when someone is aggressively, like I'm just tough, like, uh -huh. like it's like, it's like, because you have to, like that just so tells me that you're not the kind of person who is like into trying new things, you know? Uh, like mm -hmm. you're the kind of person who's gonna not want to go to a new restaurant. Like I'm just tough. I, Nothing in my butt ever, Ooh. you know. Just top and just French fries. <laughs> just, yeah, just fries and mayonnaise. I don't want anything else. <laughs> Not even ketchup. You're talking about white no, just, <laughs> everything, everything is off. That's what I'm saying. Oh, my God. Is there anything the else? The lack of adventurousness. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Also, Gabby, what would you say were any, like, priorities for you when you were dating, when you were out on the prowl? What were... What were priorities that, or yeah. turn offs? Either. Okay. Uh, priority. I mean, I have the same type in everyone. It's always like a little quieter than me, but like comes in with the witty barbs, like um, unique looking, uh, but like well put together and uh, smart. And then turn offs, mm -hmm. it's like, I kind of think I'm turned off if someone is too outgoing to the point where it's like, that's. Cause I don't want to date someone who's like me. I don't want to date anyone who's like, yeah. oh, if I see someone who's outgoing in the way I am, I'm like, that's my friend. Like I automatically friend zone mm -hmm. that person. For me, the, 
It's so, I'm such a fucking manic pixie dream boy, <laughs> Joseph Gordon Levitt, like this. But if I see some girl like journaling quietly by herself, there's nothing hotter in the world than just a quiet journaler. I'm not saying all women should be quiet, I'm just saying this is what Abby, works. All women for me. should be quiet. <laughs> Stay in your journal Stay where you journal. belong. Don't this look is the Gabby up. Manifesto. <laughs> Not a peep, but introspection. <laughs> 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 Not oh. a word out of you. <laughs> no, but I like when people yeah. talk as they get as they get more mm. comfortable. You yeah. know, like yeah. I, I don't actually like people who are too quiet. I just don't like when someone's too outgoing, like I couldn't, I don't know how you were saying, Lucas, you met someone on a mic. I don't know how anyone could date another comedian. Yeah, well, yeah I, still I have a question about that. Do you want to date someone? Like, could you see yourself dating a comedian? Me? Yeah. Oh, I wouldn't, I, I definitely, I don't hold anything against this uh, comedian who I saw and she's, I wish her well, but I definitely, I did not gel well with her personality. It was Sarah Silverman, wasn't it? <laughs> it was Sarah Silverman. <laughs> I've been just crushing Alex, on her Could ever you since not date a comedian? <laughs> oh my god, yes. I just, I just think that because I think it's like, I'm like, it's like that. We're, we're too similar. I think uh, it would just cause too much friction, right? Mm. Uh, you need someone who is not like balances you out. Yeah. Yeah, not exactly like you, right? That is something I adore about my girlfriend. Is that like, I've, I feel, I feel like I'm a very frantic frenetic person like sort of juggling lots of different things at the and I just and like something that I love about my girlfriend is that she's a very what I receive is just a very centered calm energy about her and she I she just makes me feel very very at peace and it's a very it's a very beautiful contrast to what I feel outside yeah. in other relationships and so on it's yeah it's a like I love my contrast. yeah like I love yeah. being with comedians I love being with my comedian friends um, but I, can't, I, I could not have that, like, at home. Like, as, because I, yeah, I am the chaotic energy. And I need someone else who's, like, can bring me down. And is like, okay, put things into different perspectives. And yeah. The well, stoic, like, the, the Sven to your magic. <laughs> the Sven. <laughs> oh, what a callback. I, if I was single, I don't think I would be opposed to dating a comedian. I would just need... I would just like what I said, I would just, that person would have to bring me a sense of peace when I'm with them and not feel like just constantly always in like comic brain, which is a beautiful space to be in, but I need contrast. I need a break mm -hmm. from it. I need yeah. variety. Yeah. So as long as it's someone who can provide that, then I would be open to it basically. Yeah. Um, I have another submission here that I'd love yes. to read because I think it's gonna be a doozy. Okay. Names beautiful. have been changed. Um, mm -hmm. This story takes place over the course of a year. Carl is in love with Lisa, but Lisa is not interested. Mia is interested in Carl, but Carl is still in love with Lisa. But mm. Mia and Carl make out at a party anyway, despite Carl's lack of interest. Mia feels hurt and vents to Lisa, her close friend. Uh, Lisa begins to feel things for Carl, but doesn't want to betray Mia and be a bad friend. Eventually, the girls talk. And after some dancing around, Carl and Lisa start dating. Mia discovers that she doesn't actually want a relationship, but is interested in both Lisa and Carl physically. And then one night after drinking at a bar, they have a threesome. <laughs> that was the best way that story could have ended. There's zero friction in there. <laughs> yeah. That was awesome. <laughs> that, that would was, be like, yeah. if instead of like, I don't know, like, let's say, like, Trump ran for office, and then, like, instead of him winning, it was like, but then he dropped out and decided to use his fortune for good. Like, that would be, yeah, like, yeah. it's just the best Just then they all live happily ever after. Yeah, that story sounds like everything fell into place perfectly, right? <laughs> That's just it's perfect. One, it's one of those things you hear, you're like, everything does happen for a reason, you know? <laughs> you hear other stories, you're like, the world is a chaotic, terrible place, but this is great. Just like, just congratulations. Just I'm applauding Carl, Lisa, and Mia. Just like, 
Oh, you but the sex, but the sex could ruin the friendship, though, right? No, 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 no. D- don't, don't complicate it. Do you- <laughs> no, I want to he- please complicate it. How no. do you think the sex would ruin the friendship, Alex? Like, I, I, like, isn't that a thing where like this between friends? Friends would not have sex because that would just complicate. Have you had sex with a friend? Uh, no. I could not be. Hmm. That's interesting. I am not friends with my hookup people. I don't yeah. remain friends with people I've been sexual or romantic with in the past. Not really. Yeah. There's one. Per- there's one person who I went on just a couple dates with, and then we broke things off. But we then went to see Avengers Endgame together, and we and we still keep in touch, like sending out each other memes and stuff. And it's it's the oh, one of the few exceptions of someone who I genuinely look forward to talking to, or just like sending random stuff to, who I once dated, and she's awesome. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Maybe I'm just projecting, but I'm, maybe they're fine. <laughs> but that's what this pod is about: projecting onto other people's bullshit. You can't do it in the real world, but you can do it on the fucking meerkats. Okay. Ooh, this is I. I have one up here that's a. It's a short and sweet one. I actually have a fear of dot 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 studded condoms. Like, who designs those things to look so dot 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 weird? Studded? I've never seen. Stu- I've seen ribbed condoms. I've never seen studded ones. Oh, are they different? I would imagine so. I think they're talking about ribbed condoms because oh. I imagine studded condoms as like you know those little like limited to like beads. <laughs> I imagine like Ed Hardy style like beads on the condoms. Oh my god, Ry- a rhinestone condom. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Like rhinestone, like little gems on the condom. Oh my god! <laughs> I-, I was thinking, like, you ever have like, uh, the, the cow intestine? It's like this little, uh, they have there's like, a piece of meat that has like the little little bumps on it. It's, like, it's, oh, you it's, know what? I think I have had cow. that. That's I what I, I thought of. It has this little. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's oh, right, though. Yeah, cow intestine <laughs> condoms. <laughs> my favorite oh my kind God. um if you have a fear of them don't don't you don't have to use them um mm. but maybe they look weird because they cause you pleasure i mean i don't know maybe it's worth trying a new thing yeah explore yourself <laughs> yeah should we um should we do one more and uh, wrap it up yes let's do it um let's okay it. Um, I want you to talk about the flip side of phobias. That's what this person says. Or rather, things that others find repugnant, but you're fascinated by. Example, many people have trypophobia, but I'm oddly satisfied by clusters of holes. Thanks. Whoa. Oh, my goodness. I feel that way about the word moist. I think it's nice. (laughs) I like that word. It's not a bad word. It's okay. Um, Hmm. I'm trying to think of something that other people find repulsive that I, I, this is something I, so I spent a lot of weekends in upstate New York when I was a kid. And something I would just very often do is that cows would take shit. A lot of cow shit is just like diarrhea. And when it, and when it dries, it becomes sort of, it was called like a cow pie and you would, it would just dry and be almost like a pancake and you could just flip it over and there would be worms in there. And I would like play with worms that were, I've done that before. I played shit. with worms. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of people would like find that repulsive, but it was just so natural for me to play with them when I was a kid. And it didn't, and I didn't feel like I was being dirty or touchy. And I, I don't like wash my hands when I got home, but I was like, but yeah. Do you think that's gross, Alex? I could see it. No, I could see it as a kid that's fa- being fascinated by that. That sounds, yeah. I do. It feels of dry uh, mm-hmm. frisbee poop. I, I think for, I think for me, uh, I uh, hook up a lot, right? And I'm very uh, open about talking about the sex I have. But mm-hmm. it's with my it's, it's my uh, guy Korean friends. There is very very uncomfortable about being sexualized, like themselves, and um, mm. hearing about all you know um, sexual stories. And so so it's not something that we talk about too much when you know when it's a big part of my life but it's something that like i know that they're i don't know i don't know if they're disgusted 
But like you mean like visceral descriptions of sex? It's more like the idea of having just a lot of sex. Mm, like mm. promiscuity. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They're, they're, I, think it's, I think it's just too stigmatized for them. And there's mm. not a lot of openness around talking about it. Oh, wow. That's well, interesting. I, yeah. I think it's, I think it's, it's like, well, if, if we can't talk, you know, it's funny. My mom listened to the last episode of Two Nosy Meerkats, which as you remember, it was with Chris Schur, who was one of the most wonderfully vulgar people I've ever met. Um, And my mom was like, oh my God, I was blushing. Like how many (laughs) times, you talking about how many times you've come in a day? I'm like, what? You don't want me to be happy? You don't want me coming? (laughs) So, you know, I do think once you, there is a lot of shame around sex that we all grow up with, but once you get past it, there is this funny realm to explore about it where it's like, yeah. oh, look, I can talk about this crazy thing that my body does and then like go back to like making Excel spreadsheets as if I didn't just <laughs> do that. Yeah. And more on that, I think you owe it to yourself to explore that. Is that it's part of if it's part of you being happy, you owe it to yourself to explore it. I would definitely yeah. say that. And so, so I would say, Gabby, you should ask your mom how many times she comes during a day. And, I will not yeah, no be doing that. that. And how maybe <laughs> will, she may need to up her numbers. I don't know. Maybe I it will. Like. I will absolutely never ask her that. You can ask her that when we have her on the pod, which we did say <gasps> oh, we were going to do moms on the pod. That Alex, so we're going to do moms on the pod. And we're going to do girlfriends I, on the pod. That was so hilarious. Oh my god. Hilarious dynamic. Oh my god. I'm really <laughs> looking forward to asking your mom a bunch of weird questions. And I'm actually really looking forward to the idea of my mom being on the podcast as well. There's also oh, a yeah. chance that I might be um I might be visiting my mom for the holidays. Um Oh, we could do it in person because I'll probably exactly. be fine on the holidays. Yeah, that and I'll bring like my yeah. microphone and everything. So it definitely we could do that. Oh, that'd be a blast. It would be very weird for just me being next to her. <laughs> just be like, so how many times do you come, mom? Just she'd be like, huh? Oh. Never thought I'd be if if you asked five year old me, will you ever be on a podcast talking about your mom coming? I would be like, what's a podcast? It's two thousand. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> do, do your parents listen to your stand up? Yeah, my, yeah. My 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 mine come to. I think you've met them. They've come to like. The show I've thing. seen your parents. I've oh, seen yeah, them. Yeah, 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 yeah. They came to the to the um, the bar mitzvah one you had. Yes, they came yeah. to that. I know, Alex. You talk a lot about how your parents like have not seen your comedy yeah. and, in fact, don't know that you do comedy. Yeah. Oh what God. do you think they're gonna say when they find out? Uh, they, it's it's really tied to if they know I'm gay or not, right? Because right. all my materials yeah. is based on that, and <laughs> a lot of it's just based on their homophobia. <laughs> It would be very funny if they saw your stand up and then they were like, So you're bringing a girlfriend home? Like, dude, did you listen? Did like, you not hear the content of the entire thing? About dicks and my. That's one of my I favorite of your jokes, Alex. Like, what's for dinner? Hope it's dick. Because <laughs> I love dick. Oh, I love that one so much. Uh, no. Okay, on that note, uh, we should give uh, our guest a wonderful little round of applause for being such a wonderful guest. Oh. Thank you for I mean, being yeah, the best. Thank you, Alex. Kip. And uh, so uh, this will be coming out uh, on Monday next week, I believe. Do you have anything at all to plug? Uh, social media, shows, anything at all? Uh, my Instagram is Alex Comedian. So the, it's Alex and then K-I-M-E-D-I-A-N. So it's Comedian. Stellar, um, a stellar pun. So cute. And... Uh, Oh, uh, oh, the Bonnies are the are Wednesday, the 21st of October. That's uh, that New York Comics Award show. Just like oh, yeah, small... vote for Alex as right, best new talent. Vote for Alex. Oh, I think, I think the voting is done now. Oh, fuck. Okay, don't do anything. Sorry, forgot what oh, I said. Oh, never mind. <laughs> Audience members, if you try to do something, someone will come after you. Um, <laughs> but no, but I, I am presenting the, uh, I'm presenting the LGBTQ plus award. Comic, comic oh. award. Oh, I love that. Oh, okay, awesome. Yeah, well, yeah, be fun, be fun. come out to the Bombies if you're in the New York area. Lucas, do you have anything new to plug? I actually have a couple shows coming up on October 25th and November 5th. Uh, Sid and Sabrina show I will be doing. And then a Slam Comedy. Uh, in that order, you can find more details on my Instagram at Lucas T. Arnold, uh, L-U-K-A-S-T-A-R-N-O-L-D. 
uh, on all social media where I'll be posting more info. Uh, Gabby, what about you? Uh, as always, I'm just me. Uh, <laughs> You can sign up for my open mic. Oh, well, also, I mean, you know, I could do more shows. One day I'll do more shows. Yeah. You just, apparently you just have to ask. So I'm just going to ask. ask. I'm not good at asking. I'm really, I still get really fretful about it. Yeah, um, I've never asked. Yeah. Well, also, I actually, uh, to anyone who wants to sponsor me, I just made a Patreon for myself. Uh, Patreon.com forward slash Lucas Arnold. And I believe soon we will be making Patreon for the podcast. Where yes. you can support us and our ventures. And hopefully we'll give you some perks as well. Give you bonus episodes, send you my nudes. I will not send you my nudes. I was literally thinking sending <laughs> Just <laughs> We're um, not going to, but I was thinking of it. I won't, but maybe I'll do like sexy photos that's like uh, like me somehow like lit up in a, I don't know, like f- Christmas lights, like decorated or something. I don't know. I'll do some fun shit. Be the, be the tree you are in, uh, in some. Not that people are listening to this podcast being like, I have such a huge crush on Gabby, but if they- <laughs> Too. You should be, though. I mean, look at that face. Look at these dimples. Can't get them anywhere else. Well, speaking of crushworthy, thank you, Alex Kim, our crushworthy, beautiful guest. Um, thank you, thank you so, much. so much. And fun. we've been two nosy meerkats. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.